prepared for a tax, usually for a uh, tax transaction. Um, uh, it essentially acts as an insurance policy for the parties involved in the transaction. If you do a transaction, whether it's for gift or estate or income tax, and you don't have a report prepared, you leave yourself wide open to a valuation challenge by the IRS. So having had one done, uh, at least takes something off the table for them to, uh, to go after you for. And most of the time, if they go through your report and you follow the process that they want, there won't be any challenge. There might be challenges to the underlying, the value of the underlying assets, but not the process about the report itself. So let me ask you, Jim, uh, in a report, the documents of fair market value for various interests, usually prepared for tax and transaction or tax reporting, um, it, from your opinion, uh, it essentially acts as an insurance policy. Would you, would, you, would you say that's a true statement? Yeah, I think of it as such. I would also tell you that um, uh, when, I look at doing tra uh, when I look at doing reports, depending on what's involved, if the dollar volume of the transaction is such that my malpractice won't cover it, I cannot do that particular report and I would refer it to somebody else. Got it. Um, so when, when looking at discount valuations, um, what do you consider first? Uh, lack of control, uh, lack of marketability. Um, why don't you break those two out for the for the viewers, the sure. Decision. You always start. You always start with control because it's going to ultimately dictate the degree of the lack of marketability discount. So you always have to look to see what kind of an interest are you dealing with. Um, sometimes it's not quite as easy as it looks. You could have a sixty percent limited partner's interest who has no control whatsoever. You could also look at a much smaller interest that because of the operating agreement might have control. Um, a 50% interest is neither minority nor controlling. It's sort of in the middle. You always have to define what, what, um, where you are on the control scale before you even consider marketability. Okay, and then when talking about marketability, why don't you talk about that for our audience? Okay. Um, Marketability is basically how long it takes to sell something. Uh, liquidity is different in that it's usually looking at um, uh, marketable securities per se. Marketability is just um, an estimation of the amount of time it would take to um, sell a particular interest. Um, you look like you had a question. No, go, no, obviously, go ahead. Okay. Um, so with marketability, you can have a control interest that has a, a degree of uh, marketability discount to it. That's usually in the five to 10% range, whereas a marketability discount for a minority interest will typically be somewhere in the low to mid 20s. Um, so the difference in degree is, is pretty dramatic. Um, Got it. So would you combine, so for the viewers who have never looked at a discount valuation report, as we call it, um, talk about the, the combination of like the, the percentages and how you come up to that ultimate discount valuation for that interest. Okay, so discounts are sequential. They're not additive. So when you see a report that I do, or pretty much by anyone else, they'll lay out what the pro rata value of the interest is. Then they'll uh, address what percent of uh, uh, discount for lack of control is. And after that, you would in enter your uh, discount for lack of marketability. You first multiply the pro rata value by the discount or that, uh, discount for lack of control. And then you multiply that net by the uh, discount for lack of marketability you end up with an effective uh, net discount uh, that you also present. Um, typically, I wanna make sure that I stay below the 40% range for the combined or the effective discount because I've been to enough 
uh, IRS presentations to where their audit policy is they will audit any discount over 40%. So I don't believe in being a trailblazer in this area. I think you're better off bringing it in at 38 or 39% and just stay off the radar. Got it. So when you, when you talk about doing discount valuations, I mean, just kind of backing up, what are some of the purposes that a discount valuation would be used for? Well, you can do it for gifts. You're transferring um, business interests, real estate interests between generations. Um, you might do it if you're bringing in a business partner. Um, you could do it for estate tax purposes. Um, in income tax, you can certainly do it. I've seen enough um, um, interest in um, uh, partnerships, limited liability companies, and other entities donated to charity. And so you have to address that. It goes on the charity's tax return. So um, there's a lot of areas where you need a report. And for if, if somebody were to engage us to do a, a discount valuation for, let's say, litigation purposes, a partnership dissolution, what would come to mind to you uh, when doing an evaluation for that purpose? Anything? Well, a lot of times if you're in a litigation setting, divorce, um, minority oppression, whatnot, you might, not, you might not be on the fair market value standard anymore. The biggest difference, what uh, they call it fair value in that litigation, the biggest difference between fair value and fair market value in that arena is you might not be taking any of the discounts into consideration, even if you have a minority interest. It depends on the jurisdiction. Got it. Okay. Um, so let me ask you what. Um, you know, uh, when you look at um, what clients request, right, when it comes to discount valuations, I think a common request we get is uh, we'd like to see the discount to the lower end or to the higher end, um, you know, versus, uh, let's say, a report that's being used to support a charitable, charitable donation deduction. Um, how do you answer clients when they try to look at a range, be it the lower end or the higher end? Well, that's actually a good discussion to have because um, valuation actually is a range. It's not a static or single number. So knowing where a client wants to be within the range. Um, and that also sort of suggests what their risk tolerance is. Obviously, the higher the discount, the higher the risk. The lower the discount, the lower the risk. So if your client's got a lower appetite for risk, then you will try to abide by their wish and bring it in on the lower end. I mean, that's perfectly okay. Right. And so when, when we talk about doing a discount valuation uh, for everybody who's, who's, who's listening in, you know, um, there's two components here. You've got the underlying asset that is to be valued as well. That could be a closely held company, it could be real estate, it could be, um, we've done automobiles uh, that were, were uh, the client wanted to have a 50% interest in each uh, to be valued. So um, looking at the underlying asset first, and then the discount valuation second, uh, it's a two pronged approach, not only for the, the goal of the client for the purpose of the valuation, but understanding that with that underlying asset, you have a range in value. And with the discount valuation, you have a range in value. So as Jim said, the valuation can be, uh, ultimately can be quite large, uh, quite great between the asset, underlying asset and the discount valuation. Would you agree, Jim? Yes, not only that, but the type of asset can influence the degree of the uh, lack of control discount. Uh, for example, I mean, at one extreme, you've got cash and discount for lack of control for uh, all cash asset will be much less. Um, if you look at real estate, it comes in in a certain range. If you're looking at marketable securities, you have to look at the portfolio. Are they large cap, small cap, foreign? Um, 
are they uh, uh, gold or silver? You need to know what the asset is as well because it does have an impact on that discount. Uh, good, okay, thank you. Let me ask you, what does the IRS look for in a discount valuation? So the IRS has been pretty, uh, uh, pretty instrumental in getting the whole valuation field up and running. Uh, they had a revenue ruling 5960 that sort of laid out what they wanted to see factors considered in the valuation of a um, uh, privately held business. Since then, they've re uh, released other literature, um, primarily to assist their examiners, their auditors, in trying to review um, valuation reports. Uh, in 2009, they published a, uh, a job aid, a discount for lock marketability, and every appraiser I know of has read that because it does give a, a pretty good uh, pathway for how the IRS thinks about various things. There's a bunch of different approaches to determine lack of marketability. And the service has discussions on all of those approaches and which ones they tend to favor. Um, my viewpoint there is simply they've always liked um, a review of what's called the Mandelbaum factors. So you do that usually just as a baseline, and then you can add in a couple other approaches to sort of bracket it and see where you come in at. Um, and if particularly if you're using one of the new financial approaches that hasn't seen as much litigation as some of the others, you're well advised to um, back it up with some of the more traditional approaches to determine uh, lack of marketability. Um, all of the other guidance really comes down to it's been litigated a lot. Lack of marketability has seen extensive litigation since the early 90s till current, less so lately because most of the major issues have been pretty well covered. So as long as you're cognizant of what the uh, court cases are and you look at the uh, IRS's literature, you should be able to draft a report that meets with their approval. Okay, so let me ask you, can, can a discount valuation be used to determine market value uh, in your opinion? Well, by definition, um, Revenue Ruling 5960 defines fair market value. Fair market value is the legally required standard for any tax related report. Just because it says it's fair market value doesn't necessarily mean it's real world economic value, but it is a process that produces and meets up with the legal definition of fair market value. They don't have to coincide. Well, I, I agree with you. We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes regarding mimics. So a very good point. Um, when you when you talk about you know any case sightings case study, is there anything you'd want the audience to hear that comes to mind regarding uh, evaluations? Well, the biggest one, um, and I referred to it, Mandelbaum, uh, George Judge Lero of the Tax Court back in 1995, came out in this case and did an extensive opinion as to what he thought. Um, you should consider to determine lack of marketability. He looked at some of the uh, approaches uh, that were used and he basically drafted his own report and said, these are the factors to consider. This is where your uh, uh, discounts ought to end up. He has since backed off the ranges somewhat, but he still uses those factors a lot. And he's a very active um, speaker in the value valuation world. Um, so that's the most important case. There's a handful of cases that talk about lack of uh, marketability discounts for controlling interests. And a lot of that tends to be very asset st uh, specific. And again, these are gonna be, these are gonna be very small discounts comparatively, I mean, five to 10%. Most of what I've seen has been 7%. Um, but those are, those are things that you should look at as well. Let's say somebody came to us and said they wanted a, a discount valuation for a tenants in common interest in a piece of real estate. Let's say it's a one-third interest, a TIC interest. Um, 
how would that differ for you in your analysis? Versus so that's a that's actually a, what I consider to be a different type of report, um, an undivided interest. Uh, there is methodology for um, trying to figure out what the impairment is for it not being totally fee simple, 100%. Um, it's a process that was approved by the tax court. IRS National has adopted it. So as long as you go through that particular model, then you'll end up with um, something that estimates the discount. The discounts for undivided interest are heavily influenced by cash flows. Vacant land will have a high discount. You have a very strong performing piece of real estate with really great cash flows. Discount might only be 5%. Um, really, really influenced by cash flow. So let's now let's take it to uh, to an, uh, you know kind of going to be segueing into our mimics discussion. But let's say you've got a, a client that owns uh, that needs a discount valuation, and the the asset is a twelve percent limited partnership interest, and uh, the limited partnership is, interest owns a piece of commercial real estate. When looking at that type of valuation report. Anything that you want to speak about there versus TIC? Well, the TIC report is actually pretty small because the model is pretty straightforward. I mean, you're looking at maybe five pages of analysis um, and the model itself is just two pages. So it's relatively sparse. I mean, the analysis section for a uh, valuation discount that has both control and marketability will run 25 to 30 pages. Um, it's just a much bigger report. Mm -hmm. uh, for the audience, if you had to give them a, 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 a point or two or recommendation when, when needing to do a discount valuation, uh, what would you want them uh, to know before they decide to engage a professional? Sure. So I look at it this way. You can't really do much with um, um, reports that are meant for an estate because it's historical. But if you're going to do gifting, you have enough time that you might want to tweak your operating agreements and do some other things so that you can magnify the amount of the discount that you can get rather than just pulling the trigger and saying, well, I want to transfer this. You know, um, you ought to really be engaged with a good estate tax attorney who can, who can help you modify your structure and do, do the transfer in the best way possible. <laughs> Got it. Okay, uh, very good. So let's move on to Shelly. Um, now, Shelly, uh, I'm gonna, uh, for, for, for all of you who are now um, fully, fully listening and maybe hadn't uh, engaged right at the top of the hour, Shelly um, is a uh, ongoing client of our company uh, and is a prof professional private fiduciary, an expert in the world of, of uh, taking care of people's health, wealth, uh, and just about everything under the sun. Um, and recently, Shelly had engaged our MIMIX platform, uh, which MIMIX for all of you stands for Minority Interest Market Exchange. Uh, to sell uh, numerous partnership interests that held real estate that she held in a trust. Um, so I wanted Shelly to talk about her, her uh, experience, her, um, her understanding for something that she really wasn't familiar with. Um, so Shelly, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, so I'm going to ask you a quick first question. Explain your role as a fiduciary and how you obtain the partnership interest that you require to be sold. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a licensed professional fiduciary with Pro Fiduciary Inc. So um, I work with other licensed fiduciaries uh, under the Pro Fiduciary umbrella. We, um, we have different, various different roles. In the particular case that I was working with, um, it was a very large trust estate, and the minor partnership interests were actually held in an LLC. So 
the trust owns the LLC, but the LLC owns the assets. The LLC is typically put in place um, as a, as you know, for tax purposes and protection of trust assets, various different reasons. So my job, um, so wait, well, going back for a sec, I was the successor trustee and also named as the manager of the LLC. So my job then was to value and sell the partnership interests that were held in this LLC. And there were quite a few of them and a few of them didn't have a significant value, but many of them did. Many of them were, were very large, uh, not large interests per se, but uh, interests in large companies and the values were significant. So I needed somebody like Todd and Braun and the, and the team to guide me through this process because while I've dealt with um, these types of assets in my past experience, never have I dealt with um, ones that were this valuable. So I didn't wanna take any chances. So that, that's how we connected with regard to selling these particular assets. Thanks, Shelley. So uh, another question for you, um, you know, I, fiduciaries, trust companies, trustees rely on their counsel um, quite, uh, um, quite uh, a well as part of the, 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 the process. Um, what role did your attorney have in assisting you with the actual valuation process? Let's start with the valuation process. Well, so first, the first thing that I asked my attorney to do was to review the operating agreements. So that was my, my first task. And we wanted to understand, you know, what, what we were dealing with, what, what were the assets, what was involved, how to value them. We had to get date of death valuations in this case. And so she, uh, it was a she in this is particular instance. Um, she was able to review documents, to um, agree with the valuation platform that would be acceptable by the IRS. Um, and, you know, down the road, she also assisted in creating documents that were directly related to the sale of these assets. Okay. And what hurdles did you have to overcome in valuing the partnership interest first? So that was that process was really very interesting to me because when they were valued, um, they were valued for date of death purposes for the IRS and for a, an estate tax return. And I would I would say, you know, make sure that you all understand who you're using for valuation and the process that they use to do the valuation, because it's really it's really quite important to your end game. Um, when I when I got to the place where I needed to sell my interests, I was surprised to learn that what we could sell for was very different than what it said on the valuation that we obtained. And it didn't mean that the valuation was wrong. I mean, there's a lot, as Jim was saying, there's so much involved in valuation and discounts and this and that. It, it doesn't mean that what we submitted to the IOS S was wrong, but it's a very different animal when you take those interests to the market. Yeah, and we're gonna, that's a, it's a great point. We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. Regarding the valuation report and information in the valuation report, uh, did you find, I mean, I, you know, I guess it was for both of us because we had looked at it as well. I think you, you were, and again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, uh, any, any comments regarding the valuation report and what information was there or, or not information? How did you, how did you see that being a value for you? Well, when, when my attorney and I actually looked at the backup documentation that that particular company used to come up with their valuation, we were surprised to find 
um, you know, places where they just said unobtainable, you know, this infant, they didn't obtain it because they couldn't, or they didn't have the, the, the ability to do so. So we, we did feel like we could have had a better uh, process with possibly a different company that we, that, you know, that we ultimately engaged in the beginning. Yeah, I, I would say that was, um, that was a surprise for. Yeah, when you looked at it, you, you saw that there were, there were questions as to how some of the values came to be. Yes, and I think for the audience, and you know, Jim alluded to this just a few minutes ago, you know, when when engaging a, a company or, you know, in our case, our company to do evaluation uh, of assets, whatever it is, I mean, there's going to be a laundry list of, inf of, of information that's needed. And, you know, we do our best to integrate ourselves with the client, with the attorneys, uh, with the beneficiaries, with the trustees, I mean, whoever that might be, to obtain that information uh, and to kind of, uh, at some point, kind of raise our hands in the air and say, hey, we don't have what we need to do our job. And we need that to do our job, not only to defend that valuation for your, for the IRS or for whatever purpose, but to actually give you a report that has value to you and your, and your purpose. So obtaining information we find is probably one of our biggest hurdles when it comes to valuation. Uh, and in the case of Shelley being a fiduciary, uh, or a trustee. I see people on this presentation today that are trustees and work for trust companies. Uh, you know, they're intermediaries and always don't have information at their fingertips. So, you know, we work very hard to get that. And that information is going to be critical to uh, doing that valuation of that business or of the real estate or the discount valuation as Jim would be doing. Uh, you know, it, it's critical. And in some cases, uh, Jim always says to me, well, we can't move forward until we have this, 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 and this. Right, Jim? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he is a taskmaster. Uh, and I don't blame him because, you know, the evaluation firm is signing that report, is standing behind it. And if it's used in court, if it's used for the IRS, um, you know, it has to be a substance. So, um, you know, that you know, hiring the right valuation firm, having the right credentials, understanding what they're going to be providing you, I think is very important. I think Shelly just learned that in, in the case that we were involved with. Um, so Shelly, let me ask you, what expectations did you have regarding the value of the partnership in, interest prior to sale, prior to talking to us to sell them? Is there anything you'd like to add to that? You know, because these were much larger interests that I had dealt with in the past, I didn't really know what to expect. So, you know, I knew that some of them were quite valuable, um, but I was, I was just a little anxious when I learned the very big difference between what we could actually sell the interests at versus what they were valued at. So like discounts weren't taken into consideration or, you know, a lot of the extra work that, that Jim insists and does, which is what is necessary to properly value and sell these types of interests. Right. Uh, that's a good point. And let me ask you, if you, you know, now looking back on, you know, I think we had what, uh, eight or nine interests that we sold. I, I'm trying to, trying to remember, but. Um, what, yeah. Oh, was it right? Okay. So looking back at that and looking at the, the, the experience and the pro the experience of the process, is there anything you want to talk about there for the audience? Well, um, for example, the, the mimics platform was, was wonderful because it, it provides a place to upload documents, uh, multiple parties can access the same space. And so it makes everything sort of seamless F from my point of view, the person who's supposed to be, you know, keeping tabs on everything. So I was really excited about the Mimics platform and I would absolutely use it again. 
I mean, I couldn't see using anything else, honestly. The, the other thing too is, is as a fiduciary, a trustee or um, an LLC manager, I mean, I, I don't have the ability or the knowledge to know who, you know, who's out there that wants this type of an asset. You know, I don't have the ability to, to pinpoint the market and you do, and you do because of this amazing platform, right? So you're, you're able to um, present these valuable interests to a large group of people that you know are, are people that do this, that they buy and sell these specific types of assets. I, as a fiduciary, would have no way to know who those people are without your assistance. Well, thank you. And I think something else that you want to highlight is that, you know, with process comes protection. Yes. Right? Agreed. So that protection for you to show that you went out to market, no differently if, if we were to go out and sell a house for, you know, in a state that you controlled or a personal piece of real estate or whatever other asset, mm -hmm. you want to show the your clients that you ran a process, you went to market, right? You found you found that market uh, and that market spoke, right? Mm -hmm. I think that may be an important factor for you. It, you uh, know, in this particular case was very interesting because a family member sort of came out of the woodwork and said, I wanna buy all the limited partnership interests and I'll give you this much money for them. Right. And my attorney and I were like, you know, looked at each other and said, yeah, I don't, we don't, you know, you can't, you, that's opening yourself up to liability, criticism, you know, you name it. So as it turned out, I don't think that mem that family member ended up with any of them. None. Because, yeah, because he was so under market. He yeah. just thought, I, you know, you know, he, he, you know, some people will take for granted that that fiduciary doesn't know what they're doing. Um, they know more than you do. But that's not the case, you know. We put our team together, and we have our our legal advice, and we have our, you know, property people like like Braun. We, you know, we have our dream team in place to prevent something like that from happening. Uh, 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 good point, and thank you very much. So I, I, you know, I'd like to talk to the audience about Memex. Um, which again stands for Minority Interest Market Exchange. And as Shelley had just uh, spoken about, was used for, for, her, uh, for her estate that she was uh, in charge of. Um, you know, a common question with, with Mimics is, how did it get started? Uh, you know, we've got limited time, but I, I just, it came out of a need and a client came to us and said, hey, I know you how to value the real estate and I had to sell the real estate and I had to do the discount valuation but we have a number of partnership interests in real estate. We need to sell them, go figure it out. And that's essentially what the client said to us. It was a good client of, of ours. And we, we took on the challenge, not really knowing much of anything uh, uh, as to how we would approach it. And, and after that, and we sold the, that uh, one third, it was a TIC interest in a, on a $20 million piece of real estate we realized that there was a distinct need and there's a big hole in the marketplace. That was seven, eight years ago, I think. Um, and Mimics has um, been growing ever since. Uh, so we sell all types of interests in real estate, whether it's, as Jim said, it could be a TIC, an LLC, a, G, a, a GP interest, doesn't really matter. Uh, as long as it is not the fee simple interest, uh, we will sell that interest. Uh, one of the questions that we get, and I, since we have Shelly and Jim on here, uh, which is a common question of the client that's engaging us to sell, is what's the difference between the valuation that is done uh, by us or some other company uh, versus the value that the, the market is willing to pay, what the, what the sale price would be willing, uh, willing to bear. And I guess I'm going to throw that back at Jim real quickly uh, because, you know, I, I wanted uh, Jim to just chime in and say, uh, when, when you're doing evaluation, Jim, for whatever purpose, right, your valuation metrics 
are dictated by generally who? Who would you chime in and say? Well, the metrics, <laughs> metrics used depends on uh, what the engagement is, depends on what the underlying assets are, things like that. One of the things I would say is difference between what Mimics does and what I do in the legalistic world is in the Mimics approach, you, your buyers might be known quantities. In, the, in my world, the legal world, the buyer and seller are hypothetical people. So you can have people in the Mimics marketplace and you could have maybe they're a, a, another member in one of these existing entities and sees value in acquiring another uh, part of that entity because they see value of that entity differently than what we do. Sometimes those are more strategic buyers. And sometimes maybe you get a partner or a member who's got say 30% and the interest that's being offered through Mimics might be big enough to give them control. So for that particular person, that interest could be quite valuable. So there's just a difference in, in who uh, your buyers than there would be for, for my, my side of things. Thank you. So when we talk about selling partnership interests, um, what we look at is um, when we're tasked with the, with the with the interest to sell, first is what is the underlying asset that the interest control? Whether it's a shopping center, an apartment building, an industrial building, um, you know, whether it's 200 million or 50 million, or is it 5 million? What are the underlying assets that, that are really owned by that partnership? Because that is going to dictate the value in the market. So the second is the operating agreement. What limitations does the operating agreement state that we must adhere to regarding the sale process? Um, the most common question that we're at, ta asked is, well, what if there's a right of first refusal? What happens with that? And, and my answer is, and it's always the same, that's fantastic. That means we have what's called in the bankruptcy world, a stocking horse bidder. And that stocking horse bidder is the person or the general partner or possibly a limited partner that has a first right of refusal. Doesn't mean that the, the interest can't be taken to market. It just means that somebody has a right of first refusal. In the probate world, if you want to call it that, there's the overbid process. A buyer sought for a property and then you go into court for an overbid or a multiple buyer auction. Same situation. So right of first refusals have no limitation to us in any way other than to know that we have somebody interested in buying the interest. Um, we gather a tremendous amount of information, as Shelly, I think, would, would we gave her a big headache and said, <laughs> Shelly, we need this, 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 this. And the, all these, this is our K-1s, uh, financials for the, for the partnership interest, um, property information. We needed, um, you know, P&Ls for the, for the property itself, uh, statements from the, uh, from the syndicator or from the general partner. Um, you know, we, we, we want to present to the market as much information as we can about the interest and the underlying asset, in this case called the, the apartment building, uh, that we can, right? Rent rolls, distributions, historical data points that anybody should have because, um, if they, if they are the recipient of the, uh, or owner of the interest, they're going to receive K-1s, they're going to receive quarterly reports. Uh, there's a lot of reporting that the general partner is required to provide. Um, in some cases, we have found that general partners don't want to be helpful because even though general partner is a fiduciary by the term in law, in most cases, they don't act like a fiduciary. They act like it's their place to buy the interest at a pennies on the dollar. And when they learn we're brought in to find that market value, right, Shelley? Uh, you know, some, some, some of them are pleased and appreciate what we're trying to do for their, for their limited partner. And others think uh, that you know, we're stepping on their toes. So, you know, our job is to gather as much information as we can. We put it in a data room. We provide an NDA 
uh, to uh, potential buyers. Uh, the seller provides us with a, an assignment agreement and purchase contract that is the document that will convey the interest. Uh, and then we go to market and our platforms and mimics can be a brokered sale as we call it or an auction. Uh, to date, almost all have been, um, with the exception of maybe 10% have been brokered sales. So there's no limitation on time. There are situations where we will uh, uh, come back to the client and, and give a what we call a range in value, and Jim might be part of that and talk about uh, some of the valuation metrics that the discount valuation report may have um, and, and try to provide a, a, uh, an opinion of value, both from a market standpoint and a valuation standpoint, and give that client some guidance in what to expect. But as I think Shelley, you know, just, um, you know, spoke about, it's in many situations, um, you know, somebody like Shelley as a fiduciary or a trustee knows very little about what it is they're tasked to sell. And we come in and we, we help them for, uh, you know, become organized, get the information, use uh, in, in, her, in Shelley's case, her attorney, who was absolutely fantastic, was able to um, crack the whip for us with the, with the client, was able to communicate when needed, um, helped us obtain information, and of course provided us with all the sale transfer documents. So the attorney is extremely important um, in, in this process. Um, but I, I would say to you, uh, Mimic's, Mimic's goal is to find market value. And uh, in, in, in discussing that age old question, what's the difference between the discount that Jim said in the legalistic world and what do we get? Well, there have been interests that we've sold that there might have been a 15% discount uh, to let's call it what we call par value. What is par value? Par value to us is, let's say the the uh, apartment complex was worth $100 million. We have one that we're dealing selling right now. Let's say the appraised value of the of the uh, $100 million of the, apartment, of the apartment building is $100 million today. Well, let's say our client owns a 10% interest. And for the sake of this conversation, let's just say there's no debt. Trying to make it very simple, there is zero debt. So 10% of $100 million is $10 million, simple math, right? Now, what does a buyer look at? What kind of distributions does that interest have? Is it, is it year by year? Is it quarter by quarter, right? What kind of improvements or CapEx has been made to that property? How long has that general partner owned this property, right? There's all of these factors that, like we like to say, bake the cake, when it comes to an opinion of value by a buyer. And I will tell you that yet, it is yet to be seen that we've seen any buyer come within less than half a percent of the value that they see versus the value of another, of another buyer. Meaning every buyer has a distinctly different uh, take on the value of that interest and what they're willing to pay. And as such, our platforms of sale allow that to happen and occur and allow the delta between the best buyer and the second best buyer uh, for us to manage that sale process to extract the highest and best price. And we have been unbelievably successful doing so. And our Mimics platform has been used in state and federal court matters, just to give you a sense of that. So when we look at, when we look at, um, what is that question? What is that discount? Well, discounts uh, for those called that $10 million interest in that $100 million apartment complex I'm using as this example. Well, if it's got annual distributions, it's got very little debt, uh, unbelievable management by the general partner, longstanding limited partners, um, all the great things that one would expect to, if they were to invest in a partnership. Well, that discount might very well be 10%. It might be 15%, right? Uh, if it's a great asset it's in, and it's in uh, 
let's say in uh, San Francisco, California, or it's in Manhattan, or it's in um, you know Naples, Florida, the discounts there will be minimal. If it's in Cleveland, Ohio, or in you know Jackson, Mississippi, that discount may be greater. Obviously, for the purpose of of and reasoning of just where is the real estate held. Um, in addition to that, um, you know how how clear is the financial information that we are given? How much is given to us? Uh, that will, of course, have a an effect on that value. So we've had interest that we've sold that there might be again after taking into account the the, the current valuation of the property, less debt that's or with or if there is no debt, that's called par value. Somebody that's coming in 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 a very difficult interest might see a forty or fifty percent discount, which is greater than what Jim would do or discount uh, for his purposes, as he said, his legalistic purposes. But as I always say, we are a market-driven company, and when it comes to sale, the market always determines value, period. That's it. The market is the arbiter of value, not us, not the appraiser, not the seller. It, it's just what the market's willing to bear. And um, what we're finding as we are growing Mimics and we are growing the buyer pool and the awareness that we expect over, you know, over the course of years that the discounts will uh, be less. And uh, why? Because there is a greater uh, a greater pool of buyers. Uh, one question we get all the time is, who are the buyers that buy these interests? Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, it ranges from, um, I will call a mom and pop investor to very sophisticated institutional buyers for real estate partnership interests and other types of assets. So we found that to be the case. And the variation always uh, is dictated by the underlying asset that we're selling. So, um, you know, I think for, depending on what your, what your goal is, if you're in the, a real estate professional uh, and you're a general partner, well, you hire us because you need a process uh, just like Shelley did as a fiduciary to find market value. Right, uh, and to find the bet and to find that market value for who it, who it is you're representing. If you're representing yourself and you want to sell your interest and get the highest and best value for that interest, well, obviously you want to go to market. Um, you know, in the case of litigation, uh, for many of the law firms that we work for, they want to go to market and they want to find that market value because uh, evaluation is not going to find market value. It's going to be at, at that professional's opinion. Um, so Mimics has appeal appeals to all different types of buyers, and you know the types of interest that Mimics has sell has has sold has been uh, you know LLC interests, a TIC interests, uh, LP interests. Uh, we've had a GP interest that we've sold, and the type of real estate that it's that it's sold has varied from shopping centers, apartment buildings, industrial, RV parks. Um, storage facilities, uh, land tracks, uh, I, you know, uh, I, I'm probably missing some, um, but Mimics has dealt with just about everything. Um, and, you know, when we analyze an interest before we decide to take it on, uh, we ask a lot of very difficult questions. I think Shelley would agree. Uh, we, we really had to kind of get into the weeds to know what we were tasked with in her case. Um, you would agree, Shelley? Uh, everything Absolutely. that we have to provide. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, going to market uh, first for us is always understanding what are the limitations, meaning what does the operating agreement state? I can say to you, uh, I don't know how many times we have this conversation a week. Have you read your operating agreement? And most people say no. So they don't know what the limitations of sale are or of transfer. Uh, they don't know what rights the limited and the generals have. So we go through them and we figure it out. So we then know, you know, where we're starting from. And that will then dictate to us how we're going to run the sale process uh, for the partnership interest. But I will tell you, uh, I had this conversation just the other day. 
About 70% of commercial real estate over $5 million is held in partnership in the United States. 70%. That includes REITs as well. Okay. So when you look at the size of the market of partnership interests that control almost 70% almost of commercial real estate, you look at that illiquid marketplace that exists out there that Mr. and Mrs. Smith have an interest in, a syndicator has sold, whatever it is, most commercial real estate is held in a partnership. The EBA expects in the next 15 years, there's going to be a transfer of at least 60% of those interests. Why? Because of taxes, uh, death, um, transfer, uh, family member just wants their money, uh, whatever the reason is, right? Or the general partner decides they want to sell. Right? There's all kinds of reasons, but in the next 15 years, you're going to see the biggest wealth transfer, and that's held in partnership, partnership of real estate. So that size of that market is astonishing, and I will tell you that when you look at the commercial real estate world and you look at the lack, at the lack of liquidity, well, the lack of liquidity is always it's tied up in partnership. And uh, one, thing, uh, one thing that's coming to mind common question, can I finance that? We have found a couple specialty lenders in New York that would be that have considered offering financing for the purchase of a partnership interest. They would have to be large underwritten assets. Um, I would say class A, class B plus, but the Bs and the Cs and the Ds, no. So it is a cash buyer. Uh, another question that we get uh, commonly is can we exchange into it? And I have been told by different tax professionals, uh, both yes and no, depending on what that party that needs to exchange into has as a requirement. Um, I know we're just about at the top of the hour. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, I hope I've covered as much as I can here. Uh, if there's any questions for Jim or Shelley, uh, you can, um, uh, just uh, chat if you like and ask that question or take off your mic if you'd like to do so uh, and ask the questions directly to them. Um, anybody have any questions? This is Danielle. Um, this might be a question that needs to be answered more long than we, we have time for, but I had a question. What if you have a trust that owns small partnerships? because I understand the evaluations can get pretty pricey. So if you're a trustee, um, you know, if you're getting an evaluation for thousands of dollars or 5,000 or whatever it might be for the price of that evaluation, um, and then the LLC actually is worth very little, what do we do in that case? Well, that's a good question. I wouldn't have thought of to ask that, but I'll, I'll, I'll answer it. Uh, it. If you have a date of death, uh, requirement, you're going to need to do that valuation, period, right? There, there's no, you have no choice. If it comes to just for, for gifting or distribution, uh, well, then I would say to you, you do not, um, you don't, don't need to worry about having to pay for evaluation. We'll do that analysis as part of our sale process. So that will not be an issue. Okay. I, I think the, 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 the other thing to think about too is, you know, what is, we've sold many interests that have been less than 1%, a half a percent, a quarter of a percent, you know, it, it can, it varies uh, as much as, uh, as Jim would say, you know, a, my, a majority interest is 50.1%. Uh, anything less than that is a minority interest. So uh, that range of percentages of interest that we've sold runs the absolute gamut. Um, for, uh, so I hope that answered that question. So it depends on really what you need. Yes, uh, ask the question, please. Are you talking to me? Yes. Okay, it, good morning or good afternoon by now. It's Leon Owens. Uh, this seems like a very simple way for people to exit. There's the challenge. On the other hand, like the, somebody just asked, how much is the process and how long does it take? That's a good question, Leon. So the process can take you know, I'd say at the short end, 60 days, that's probably the absolute shortest end, but I'd say the average is probably three to four months. 
Uh, at the long end, we've had interest that we've had on the market and it's taken us 10, 11, 12 months to sell. So um, it really depends on what it is we're tasked with because there's such a variation there. Uh, does yes. It, does the Department of Real Estate oversee any part of this? Uh, yes, uh, we are licensed and as such as uh, we have our DRE licensing. We also have our uh, Series 7 licensing. So it's a, for some states, it's a security interest. Uh, yeah. And you know those will be depend on what what is required in that in in that instance. So great questions. As far as costs, and I'll end it with this because I know we're over the hour. Our fees are gener are 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 per or stated based upon the scope of work that we're doing. So there isn't a standard fee. It's not a standard percentage of four percent or ten percent or three percent. We look on it on a case by case basis because every single um, every single uh, interest that we've taken on has had a huge variation. Um, but we are over the hour. I want to say if anybody wants to reach us, you can um, send me an email personally. That's Todd at Bronco.com, T O D D at Bronco.com, info at Bronco.com, uh, or our website, Braun Mimics, uh, B R A U N M I M X.com is our Mimics platform. Uh, and um, any Thank questions you. you have, uh, please follow up uh, with us after. Uh, and I want to say thank you to, uh, I want to say.